Hello, and thanks for joining us for this episode of Into the Killing. If this is your first episode, thanks for checking us out. If you find it interesting, we hope you'll go back and listen to our other episodes. If you've already listened to other episodes, or all of them, we can't thank you enough. Before we start, we want to remind you that if you know of any good cases we should cover on Into the Killing, we'd love to hear from you. We also want to know if you know of any good true crime stories for our YouTube channel, Criminally Listed. And if you know of any good stories about the supernatural, including your own experiences, please let us know for our channel, Paranormally Listed. To submit these cases, visit our website, criminallylisted.com, and then go to the Suggest a Case page. For this episode, we're going back to September 1980. On September 1st, 1980, 22-year-old Terry Fox ended his Marathon of Hope. In 1977, Fox had his right leg amputated after being diagnosed with cancer. Even though Fox only had one leg, he planned to run from the east coast of Canada to the west coast to raise money for cancer research. It was a distance of over 5,000 miles. His initial goal was to raise a million dollars. He later changed his goal to 24 million, or one dollar from every Canadian. Unfortunately, Fox had to stop running outside of Thunder Bay, Ontario, 143 days after he started, because cancer had spread to his lungs. Fox's run inspired the citizens of Canada. By the time he ended his Marathon of Hope, he had raised $1.7 million. The week after he stopped running, a telethon was held on a national television network and an additional $10 million was raised. By April 1981, $23 million had been raised. Tragically, 22-year-old Terry Fox died nine months after he ended his run on June 23, 1981. The first annual Terry Fox run was held on September 13, 1981. It has since expanded to 60 different countries. Since that initial run, the Terry Fox Foundation has raised over $850 million for cancer research. Today, over four decades after Terry Fox started his run, he is considered a national hero in Canada. Several schools are named after him, and several monuments are dedicated to him. Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, which later became Mothers Against Drunk Driving, was founded on September 5, 1980. Better known by its acronym, MAD, the foundation was started by 34-year-old Candy Leitner. Four months earlier, on May 3, 1980, Candy's 13-year-old daughter, Carrie, and a friend were walking to a church carnival in Fair Oaks, California. Suddenly, a car plowed into Carrie from behind. She was knocked out of her shoes and flew 125 feet. The driver of the car then took off. 13-year-old Carrie was later pronounced dead. Three days later, 47-year-old Clarence Bush was arrested for vehicular manslaughter. Bush had three prior DUI convictions, and when he killed Carrie, he was on a bail for another DUI arrest two days earlier. In November 1980, Bush made a plea deal and was sentenced to a maximum of three years in prison. He ended up serving a year in prison. Matt has advocated for harsher punishments for people convicted of driving under the influence, and they support those affected by drunk driving and try to prevent underage drinking. Their ultimate goal is to stop drunk driving. On September 9, 1980, actress Michelle Williams was born in Kalispell, Montana. When she was nine, her family moved to San Diego, California. She became interested in acting at a young age. When Williams was 13, she got her first television role as a guest star on Baywatch. The following year, she made her film debut in a supporting role in Lassie. Williams' breakout role was playing Jennifer Lindley in the teen drama Dawson's Creek. She appeared in all six seasons. Williams has since become one of the most critically acclaimed actresses working in Hollywood. She was nominated for her first Academy Award in 2016 for a supporting role in Brokeback Mountain. She's since been nominated four more times for the films Blue Valentine, My Week with Marilyn, Manchester by the Sea, and The Fablemans. In 2019, she won an Emmy for playing Gwen Verdon in Fosse Verdon. She has also been nominated for a Tony for her role in the Broadway play Blackbird. On September 4, 1980, the number one song was Upside Down by Diana Ross. The number one movie was the action comedy Smokey and the Bandit 2. In September 1980, 15-year-old Nanine Grimes lived in Thornton, Colorado. Thorne is about 10 miles north of downtown Denver and is part of the Denver Aurora Lakewood metro area. Nanine's parents got divorced when she was young. She and her sister, Deanna, lived with her mother, Gwen. Deanna told the television show, Unusual Suspects, that the divorce was tough on Nanine. She said that Nanine wanted a storybook family with family dinners every night and church on Sundays. Both Nanine and Deanna attended Thornton High School. On the night of September 12, 1980, Nanine was home alone. 
She was talking on the phone with a friend about a school project. Then she heard a knock at the door. She never phoned her friend back. We're just going to take a short break from this episode to bring you word from our sponsor, True Crime Obsessed. If you love True Crime Podcasts, I want to tell you about True Crime Obsessed. Each week on True Crime Obsessed, hosts Patrick and Jillian tell a fascinating true crime story by recapping a popular documentary based on the case. Their storytelling is detailed and suspenseful, but also entertaining and funny. A listener review put it best by saying, These two strike the perfect balance between humor and thriller. Listening to them, I'm belly laughing, while at the same time locking my doors and turning on all my lights. With over 200 million downloads and a thriving community of listeners, True Crime Obsessed has been at the top of the podcast charts for over six years. They have over 30,000 five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts, and their live shows sell out all over the U.S. and internationally. They even host an annual weekend-long fan convention called Obsessed Fest, where they bring together thousands of their listeners with some of the top true crime creators in the world. So if you've never checked out True Crime Obsessed, now's the time to join their community. So if you're looking for a new true crime obsession, follow True Crime Obsessed wherever you get your podcasts. There are over 300 episodes waiting for you to check out right now, covering everything from serial killers to notorious murders to the cases you haven't yet heard about, but won't be able to forget. That's True Crime Obsessed, wherever you're listening right now. Deanna, Nadine's 16-year-old sister, arrived home at about 11.30 from her part-time job. As she got close to the house, she noticed that something was off. The front door was open. When she got inside, she noticed that the stereo was blaring. She expected to find her sister winding down for the night. Instead, it looked like Nadine had a party. Deanna went looking for her sister. She got a sickening feeling when she started walking down the hallway and saw blood. Then, when Deanna made it to the bedroom, she found the dead body of her 15-year-old sister on her waterbed. It was clear her death had been brutal. Upon initial examination, it was clear that the 15-year-old girl had been stabbed dozens of times. The medical examiner counted 86 stab wounds on the front and back of her body. Nanine was attacked in the hallway and then tried to escape from her killer. She ended up in her sister's bedroom, where the killer continued to stab her. There were puncture wounds in the mattress, and it was leaking water. There were no signs of sexual assault. It was clear that the killer had attempted to clean up before they left the house. There was a lot of blood in the bathroom sink. The police found an important clue in the bathroom. It was a partial fingerprint on one of the taps. Outside, the police found more blood on the walkway and the garden hose, which was turned on. The blood looked fresh and had not dripped off the killer's clothing. So the investigators thought that the killer probably cut himself during the frenzied attack. On top of Nanine's body was a handkerchief. The police were not sure why the killer left it there. Something else the police didn't know was the motive for the murder. Nothing was stolen from the house, so it didn't seem like robbery was the motive. Plus, the overkill didn't make sense if it was a robbery. Instead, it seemed like the murder was personal. But, by all accounts, Nanine was a kind and sweet girl, so she didn't have any enemies. Since she wasn't sexually assaulted, she wasn't killed to keep the murderer's identity a secret. Although she wasn't sexually assaulted, the police thought that the killer might have been sexually aroused from stabbing the victim. The police got their first lead from Deanna. She was sure that the killer was her mother's on-again, off-again boyfriend. Deanna thought that he drank too much and had a violent temper. Nanine did not like the boyfriend and avoided him as much as possible. The boyfriend was questioned and he admitted that he drank too much sometimes and he said he didn't have a good relationship with Nanine, but he said he didn't harm Nanine. He also had a solid alibi for the time of the murder. He was having dinner with Nanine's mother, Gwen, at his parents' home. Gwen said that was true, but also said he may have slipped out without her noticing. But his parents claimed he was at home the entire time. So the police continued to look at other suspects. Then the police got a tip from a local resident. They said that their teenage nephew, who was a bit of a drifter, arrived at their home on the night of Nanine's murder. He was covered in what looked like blood, and he had cuts on his body. Turned out they had a criminal record 
which included attempted robbery and attempted hijacking. He was brought to the police station in question. The police noted that he would lie about basic things like his age and his criminal record, so they weren't sure what to believe when he talked. He said he had hitchhiked into Thornton from Salt Lake City, Utah on the night of the murder. He would have entered the city on Interstate 25 and Nadine lived two blocks from the interstate. The police collected the young man's clothing and got his fingerprints. His fingerprints didn't match those left at the crime scene. Also, it wasn't blood on his clothing. It was just dirt and grease. Another suspect was a handyman who did work around the family's home. Gwen and Deanna thought he was creepy. He spent a lot of time talking to Nanine and Deanna. When Nanine mentioned that she had never been to a Denver Broncos game, he gave her $40 to get tickets. In 2023, that's about $147. Why would a handyman who came to do work hand over that type of money to a 15-year-old girl he had just met? Gwen also remembered that he had a large knife. The police searched the handyman's truck and found a large knife under one of the seats. They collected it and sent it to the lab for testing. The handyman was questioned and he denied having anything to do with the murder. He provided an alibi he was at dinner with friends. They also checked his hands. He didn't have any cuts or injuries. The police were also able to confirm his alibi. And finally, no blood was found on the knife, so the handyman was cleared as a suspect as well. A fourth suspect emerged at the funeral. It was a friend of Nanine's. They used to hang out at Nanine's house. He would play the guitar while she read Bible passages. He played in a Christian rock band and performed a song at Nanine's funeral. Some detectives who attended the funeral thought that the song was odd. The friend also showed a lot of emotion at the funeral. Nanine's family thought he was acting over the top. The police also learned that he wanted to be more than friends with Nanine but she didn't want the relationship to go that way. However, the police found no physical evidence that connected him to the murder. He didn't have any cuts on his body, and his fingerprints didn't match, so he was cleared as a suspect as well. Since the murder was so violent, the police thought that he may have killed someone else. They even knew of another similar murder that happened eight months earlier. 13-year-old Kathleen Boyer was found stabbed to death in a ditch in a park in Thornton. Her body was found about a mile from Nanine's house. Kathleen had been stabbed 21 times. There were no signs of sexual assault. So the police thought that one person was responsible for both murders. The citizens of Thornton were aware that one killer might be preying on teenage girls. This frightened many people. But months and years went by and there were no more murders. No progress was made in either case. Then in May 1988, there was a break in one of the cases. A man in his mid-twenties named Samuel Dean Salaz had told several people he had killed Kathleen Boyer. Those people went to the police, but the police didn't have enough evidence to charge him with murder. Then in May 1990, 27-year-old Samuel Salaz walked into the police headquarters in Thornton. He confessed the murder of Kathleen. He was 17 years old at the time of the murder. He said he killed her because she rejected his sexual advances. He also said he wanted to know what it felt like to stab someone. When he was asked why he confessed, he explained that he was from a religious family and he said if he didn't clear his conscience, he thought he was going to hell. But amazingly, the police didn't arrest him. Besides his confession, they didn't have enough evidence to arrest him. Then, when the police confronted him later, he recanted his confession. But, in November 1990, he was indicted for first-degree murder and arrested. He made a plea deal and pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. In January 1992, 12 years after Kathleen's murder, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. After he confessed, the police thought he was a good suspect in the murder of Nanine Grimes. He had gone to school with Nanine and Deanna. He also lived in the same area and took the same school bus. But he claimed he had nothing to do with Nanine's murder. Also, since he confessed to one murder in an attempt to cleanse his soul, if he killed Nanine, why wouldn't he have admitted to both murders? Slaz was ultimately cleared as a suspect in Nanine's murder when his fingerprints didn't match the fingerprint found at the crime scene. 
so Nanine Grimes' case went cold once again. In June 2004, the case was reopened. It had been 24 years since 15-year-old Nanine Grimes was killed. As you probably already know, DNA profiling had come to the forefront of criminal investigation. In 1980, the biggest movie of the year was Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back. It made more money than the second and third biggest movies combined. Those movies were both comedies, 9 to 5 starring Dolly Parton, Jane Fonda, and Lily Tomlin finished second, and third was Stir Crazy, starring legendary duo Richard Price and Gene Wilder. In 2004, the three biggest movies were Shrek 2, Harry Potter, and The Prisoner of Azkaban, and Spider-Man 2. In 1980, some popular television shows that debuted include Magnum P.I., That's Incredible, and Boo Some Buddies, starring Tom Hanks. Major television shows that debuted in 2004 included Lost, Entourage, and Veronica Mars. Popular books published in 1980 were The Born Identity by Richard Ludlum, Cosmos by Carl Sagan, and The Confederacy of Dunces by John Kennedy Toole. The Confederacy of Dunces was published 11 years after the author died of suicide. He was distraught after failing for years to get his work published. After his death, his mother worked to get his novel published. The Confederacy of Dunces won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction the following year and today is considered a masterpiece. In 2004, popular books that were published included Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell, Let the Right One In by John Avid Lindquist, and Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell by Susanna Clark. In 1980, one of the most popular story arcs in comic books ran in Marvel's X-Men, The Dark Phoenix Saga. After appearing in Werewolf by Night, The Vigilante with multiple personalities, Moon Knight got his own comic series. DC launched the New Teen Titans, which featured Robin, Wonder Girl, and Kid Flash in the main roles. They also introduced one of DC's fan-favorite anti-heroes, Deathstroke, the Terminator. 2004 saw the debut of Scott Pilgrim by Brian Lee O'Malley. DC launched their murder mystery story arc, Identity Crisis, and Swamp Thing began its fourth series. In 1980, Pac-Man was released to the arcades, Adventure was released for the Atari, and Mattel released several sports games, simply called Baseball, Skiing, and Basketball, for their console, the Intellivision. In 2004, Atari and Intellivision were considered ancient history in terms of game consoles. Half-Life 2, Grand Theft Auto, San Andreas, and World of Warcraft were some of the biggest games released that year. A sample of Nanine's killer's blood that was found at the crime scene was sent for DNA testing. A DNA profile was created and was entered into the FBI's combined DNA index system, also known as CODIS, but no match was found. The investigators were a bit surprised. They didn't think that someone could break into the home of a teenage girl, stab her 86 times, and then live a crime-free life. But it appeared that way because the case went cold again. Months later, in early 2005, one of the investigators requested that the DNA be tested again. Much to their surprise, they got a match. The DNA belonged to a 42-year-old man named Troy Brownlow. Brownlow had been convicted of theft in Maricopa County, Arizona. He was sentenced to three years in prison. When he was released in April 2004, a DNA sample was taken. His DNA was entered into CODIS shortly after Nanine's killer's DNA was run through the system. At the time, CODIS only stored known offenders, so that's why the killer's DNA was not in the system when Brownlow's DNA was entered into the system. The police investigated Brownlow's background. At the time of the murder, he was 16 years old and lived in Thornton. In fact, he lived half a mile from Nanine and attended the same high school as her. Nanine's sister, Deanna, knew Brownlow. She had known him since they were 8 years old. They were in the same grade and had ridden the same bus together. She remembered him as the class clown. After Brownlow graduated from high school, he got a job with the YMCA in Denver, Colorado. In 1984, he was charged with larceny. It's unclear what the result of that charge was. In the mid-1990s, he was the youth director at the YMCA in Denver. He stayed in that position for two years. In 2000, he was charged with firing a gun at his girlfriend. Once again, it's unclear what the results of those charges were. Brownlow had never been a suspect in Nanine's murder. No one knows any cuts on his hands in the days after the murder. Brownlow's fingerprints were also on record. 
They were compared to the print that was found on the water tap. It was a match. With the DNA and the fingerprint evidence placing him at the crime scene, the police knew that they had found Nanine's killer. On April 14, 2005, 42-year-old Troy Brownlow was arrested at his workplace in Tucson, Arizona. After Brownlow was arrested for Nanine's murder, he was interrogated. He didn't say much before asking for a lawyer. But police noticed scar tissue on his hands that looked like they were from knife cuts. While awaiting trial, Branlow told his cellmate he had killed Nanine. He also told him how he explained how his DNA ended up at the crime scene. He was going to say a second man was there that night and he was the one who killed Nanine. Branlow was going to explain that his blood was there because he hurt himself defending Nanine. The cellmate went directly to the authorities and told them what Branlow had told him. The police were able to piece together what happened on the night Nanine Grimes was murdered. They believed that Brownlow might have come looking for Deanna that night. He knew her better because they were the same age and they had been in the same classes. But he settled on Nanine when he found her alone. Troy Brownlow went to trial in June 2005. The trial lasted a week. He was found guilty of first degree murder. He was sentenced to 20 years to life. He was first eligible for parole in July 2020, but he was denied. He'll be able to apply for parole again in July 2025. At the time of this recording, 58-year-old Troy Brownlow is serving a sentence at the Trinidad Correctional Facility in Malo, Colorado. One thing that disturbed the people of Thorn was what were the odds the two teenage killers, Samuel Salaz and Troy Brownlow, who stabbed to death two young girls that lived in the same area, attended the same school at the same time, and even rode the same bus. It seemed odd that such a peaceful and quiet city could produce two violent young men. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. As we mentioned in the opening, if you have a case you want to suggest for our podcasts or YouTube channels, please visit criminallylist.com. Thank you again for listening. Please take care of yourself and stay safe.